Hey everyone, it is Friday, it is 2 p.m. So it is time for Friday Forecasting Talks from the Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. And uh, this will be the last webinar that we have in this season. We will be thinking what to do next and how to amend them. Uh, today we will have a presentation by Evangelos Spiliotis. Uh, he's a uh, professor in Athens University. Um, I think he will introduce himself later, but uh, before he does that, uh, I wanted to say a couple of words about uh, the center. That's what I typically do anyway. So the Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting provides a variety of services. We are not just uh, a research-based center. We are interested in working with companies and trying to understand what impact we can make and how we can make the world a better place. So we have a variety of services that we provide, including bespoke uh, short courses, consultancy, master summer projects, and so on. We also help uh, a couple of software developers, uh, software development companies, uh, and we have opportunities for PhD research or KTP knowledge transfer partnership. Our expertise is uh, in forecasting, obviously, marketing analytics, and more specifically, we focus on demand forecasting and supply chain forecasting. So all these areas that companies uh, might be interested in to improve their inventory or to improve their marketing decisions, that's our area of expertise. And you can see the list of members below. Uh, we have a variety of members, as you see, with different interests, because uh, some of us work uh, and focus on machine learning, the others focus on statistical methods for forecasting, and the others on judgment, judgmental adjustments, and so on. Right, so how to keep in touch with us? We have a variety of ways. There is a Twitter account, Lancaster Simov, uh, where we publish uh, events related to forecasting and uh, things happening in the center. LinkedIn is another way of uh, getting in touch with us. Email, sort of old school, but uh, you know, quite good way of getting in touch. Uh, the website and there is a YouTube channel where we typically upload videos from these events and from other events that the center holds. Right, now let's uh, go to the presentation. So, uh, Vangelis, can you please uh, start sharing your screen? Uh, hi, Van, thank you. Uh, for having him, for having me here. Can you uh, share the screen? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's the okay. presentation. Yeah, good. All good. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm uh, Vagelis uh, Spiliotis. Uh, I'm a research uh, associate at the uh, Forecasting Strategy Unit at the National Technical University of Athens. Uh, my research interests are more about uh, forecasting competitions, uh, machine learning for time series forecasting, um, and uh, also like a lot uh, uh, applications for retail forecasting and uh, energy forecasting. Uh, so today I'm gonna uh, focus more on the machine learning uh, aspect of uh, my research agenda and uh, uh, more specifically on uh, some um, techniques, let's say, that uh, one can use in order to uh, make um, his uh, machine learning model generalized better or in simple words, uh, make it produce more accurate forecasts for uh, uh, data that the model hasn't uh, seen while training. So to get uh, started, uh, we've all uh, heard about uh, machine learning. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, successful applications of machine learning in uh, uh, emergency pitch recognition, uh, customer support, for detection. Okay, so lots of uh, uh, application where machine learning has become uh, the standard for supporting uh, decisions. Uh, so, naturally, over the last uh, uh, decade, machine learning methods have uh, also found 
uh, a lot of uh, applications in the field of uh, forecasting, particularly neural networks, various forms of uh, neural networks. And uh, more recently, we have also seen some uh, powerful um, uh, regression uh, tree-based algorithms in order to, to generate uh, forecasts. Now, um, before I continue, I should say that um, uh, although these techniques have been widely used <coughs> in applications where you naturally have a lot of data to work with, for example, in energy or in financial uh, forecasting, uh, in some other areas where you do not really have lots uh, of uh, data to, to work with, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, sometime uh, past till we see some successful implementations of uh, this kind of algorithms. Um, but now we're uh, at, a, at a good point, I believe. Uh, we have some uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, machine learning forecasting methods that have uh, proved their values, uh, both in uh, independent studies, uh, but also in uh, Kaggle competitions and also in um, two competitions I have uh, organized, the M4 and the uh, M5. Uh, actually, today we're going to see an application on the M4 uh, competition data, which consists of uh, um, uh, diverse time series coming from uh, different domains, finance, microeconomics, microeconomics, etc. Uh, so, uh, here I just have a brief note of uh, what is can be considered as, as state-of-the-art uh, for each type of algorithm. Uh, for neural networks, we uh, currently have the DPAR uh, from Amazon. It's basically a probabilistic autoregressive recurrent neural network. Uh, and uh, we also have the MBITS, which uh, uh, became popular in 2019 um, after uh, Orlenskin and his colleagues published um, uh, some very promising results on the M4. It's basically a multi-layer uh, perceptron, uh, just of a very of a truly deep uh, architecture. It's again uh, an autoregressive model. And uh, what is uh, really innovative with that uh, model is that uh, it uh, produces forecast based on uh, both backward and forward residual links. Finally, in uh, in the field of uh, uh, decision trees, we have LiveGBM, which is, uh, I believe, currently considered the most efficient uh, and accurate way to apply uh, uh, gradient boosting. Um, uh, uh, so it's basically a, a gradient boosting uh, machine uh, that uh, uh, has a, a few tricks in order to, to, to make the model converge uh, faster and also uh, handle more effectively uh, more futures. Now, uh, uh, I want to say a few things before I continue about, uh, you know, the, the, the key idea behind data-driven models and uh, why in some cases we may be uh, finding it difficult to, to train such models. Um, well, when you, when you have a, a statistical model or uh, by that I refer to models like uh, exponential smoothing or ARIMA models, you basically uh, prescribe the data generation a process of uh, your time series. Okay, So, for example, you assume that uh, you have a linear trend, you assume that there is a particular type of uh, seasonality. Uh, so, uh, you make some uh, assumptions and based on these assumptions, you may be able to forecast time series that uh, uh, for, for which you have uh, a limited uh, amount of data. On the contrary, machine learning methods generally make a few uh, or very limited uh, assumptions about the, the data generation process. So the, the relationships uh, between the data points are identified and estimated automatically. So this gives you more flexibility. You make less assumptions. Uh, and uh, you let the model basically learn from uh, a trial and error uh, process. Um, typically, you also you can also have larger models in terms of parameters that can be trained. Uh, so uh, all these, uh, of course, uh, benefits comes with uh, an additional cost that 
Uh, you need to have access to more data in order to optimize all these parameters in order for your model to be able to learn from these examples. Now, in a typical uh, format, uh, most uh, time series forecasting models uh, that use machine learning techniques will exploit uh, an auto uh, regressive process like the one you can see here. We ba you, you basically uh, have uh, a time series with a black line and you uh, create what we call some input windows. So these are the information. This is the information that your model will have access to in order to provide forecast. And uh, you also have some output windows, which is the target of uh, of uh, your uh, of your algorithm. Okay. So this is the information you know, and this is what you want your neural network or your uh, gradient boosting machine to to learn. Now, as you can understand, when you have a, a very long series, you can create multiple uh, windows like that and uh, let your model uh, be trained effectively. But if your series is relatively, relatively short and your forecast depends just on past data and you do not have uh, lots of, let's say, external variables to, to exploit for your forecast, then things uh, become uh, become more challenging. Even if you consider, for example, overlapping windows um, and stuff like that. Okay, so it, it, it gets a little bit challenging to 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 train a model uh, in a uh, you know using just the historical observation of your series. <clears throat> this is uh, an example of what I've been discussing earlier. Okay, this is this is a series that you know by observing it you are you can uh, easily you know uh, uh, understand how the future may look like and this is uh, uh, you know uh, you can produce some forecast for that time series uh, for example by uh, prescribing that the uh, that time series does not have any trend and it has an additive seasonality uh, for example, using uh, an, an exponential smoothing model. Uh, however, if you try to forecast that time series with uh, a neural network, which has hundreds or even in some cases thousands of uh, uh, trainable parameters, you know the, the, the input windows that you can create won't be um, uh, enough in order to accurately estimate all those uh, parameters. And even if you try to, to force your model to learn these kind of patterns, it will most uh, likely overfit to, to the data, so result in poor uh, post-sample uh, performance. And another thing is that even if you really uh, create many uh, windows for that uh, time series in order uh, for your model to have more information to, to be trained on, uh, you, you basically uh, you know, have the same information repeated and repeated again in, uh, in different versions. So um, the the training process won't be uh, that good. So we have to identify some some ways in order to exploit these uh, models that we know they're um, they can provide uh, good forecasts. And uh, you know, a, a good direction to it is to find ways to generate uh, more data. Uh, for the training process. Now, the, the, the easiest way to do that is, of course, to, to work with these kind of algorithms in applications where the series are naturally long enough. Okay, so here you, you have um, uh, more windows to, to create. They will also be very representative of, um, of the future because, you know, they refer to, to the same uh, series you're trying to forecast. Uh, however, if this isn't possible, another way would be, uh, you know, to, to try to uh, identify other series or create other series that have similar patterns with uh, the series being forecast uh, and exploit this kind of information to, to uh, enhance the, the training uh, of, uh, of your algorithm. Now, at this point, there are a lot of uh, possible limitations to do that because, uh, for example, you when you uh, uh, you know try to find series that look like uh, the series that you're trying to predict, 
there are a lot of questions like you know how I can make sure that these series are similar how do I measure similarity uh, how, how uh, many series should I collect okay these are some questions that uh, um, we do currently have some answers uh, to these questions but it's uh, you know something that uh, it's still um, uh, research under uh, prog uh, progress uh, so to, to summarize I think uh, till 2017 at least uh, uh, the local models that were trained in a series by series fashion were considered the standard practice uh, in the field and uh, these models may still work well for uh, time series that uh, are long enough like I said um, actually there was uh, uh, a pretty highly cited paper by myself and Professor Matilakis on a comparison of these uh, local, locally trained machine learning models and some statistical models where uh, we showed that even you know simple statistical models work better than this uh, kind of, uh, of, uh, of models but uh, most uh, recently uh, like I discussed there are a lot of uh, machine learning models and uh, particularly deep learning uh, neural networks that can uh, provide uh, better performance. Some examples are uh, provided uh, also by the M4 and the M5 competitions where uh, the winners, uh, the winning submissions were dominated by uh, machine learning uh, models among which were uh, live GBM um, and, and uh, some re deep regarding neural networks. Uh, so, um, uh, like I said, the, we would we'd ideally uh, want to uh, create more, more data to train our, our models. The first option would be to try to collect more real series that uh, look similar to the series being uh, predicted. This is very time consuming. Personally, I have uh, uh, created the uh, data set that uh, a database that consists of uh, about one million time series collected from various uh, public uh, resources and actually the, the data set of the M4 competition is part of uh, was part of uh, that database uh, so you can use a data set like that to to have more series to work with but this is really time consuming and you also have to you know prepare uh, uh, some infrastructures to, to collect this, this time of data and also it's very difficult to identify um, publicly available series that really look similar to the ones you want to predict so this sounds like a good idea but it's not always applicable uh, the second way would be to try to generate some artificial series um, Again, this may be time consuming, but at least, you know, you have to, to identify an algorithm that uh, provides, that generates, for, that generates a series that looks similar to the ones you're trying to, to predict. So it's more straightforward. And um, in fact, there are a lot of um, um, algorithms out there to do that. Okay, so uh, you, you have a, a good point to, to start with. Uh, and the third idea that I'll be discussing more about is uh, augmenting existing series. So having some techniques that can help you uh, increase the sample of your data. Um, now, augmentation techniques uh, have been out for quite uh, a time. Um, in the field of machine learning, we've seen a lot of augmentation techniques for image classification and speech recognition, among others. Uh, but in forecasting, the, the research is uh, more limited. Uh, so I will start by showing some um, uh, indicative uh, uh, applications, some indicative algorithms that one can use to um, create uh, artificial series or augment the, the data uh, already available. Uh, I will start with some algorithms that are already available out there and I will uh, finish with uh, some uh, uh, more innovative uh, approaches. The first uh, algorithm is uh, uh, about uh, bootstrapping. 
uh, it's uh, particularly here I describe the algorithm uh, uh, presented by Bergmeier, Heinemann, uh, and their colleagues. It's uh, basically an algorithm where you can uh, decompose uh, your time series into trend, uh, seasonality, and noise. Uh, so you, the, the idea here is that you remove the trend, you remove the seasonality, you get the remainder of, uh, of the series, you uh, shuffle uh, the remainders, and then you add uh, back the, the trend and the seasonal uh, component. Okay, so it's, a, it's basically a, a, a bootstrapping approach uh, for, for um, uh, augmenting your original series, and um, the result will look um, uh, like this. Okay, with the black line, you see the original data, and if you apply this algorithm, you, you're going to create, um, uh, you know, as many time series as you want uh, that uh, have the same uh, signal in terms of uh, trend and seasonality, but there are small variations in terms of, uh, of noise. Okay, so um, you, by, by doing that, you basically have the advantage that your model will learn how to optimally forecast the signal and uh, ignore, uh, you know, the, uh, the random variations in your, in your time series. And uh, of course, you, uh, since you can create a lot of time series, you can uh, augment more uh, look-back windows to train your model. Uh, so, some advantages of these techniques, uh, you, you can effectively remove some extreme values and uh, structural changes. The drawbacks is that it's uh, computationally expensive and also this is a process that you have to do uh, offline. Okay, So, you have to uh, fetch your data, uh, apply the bootstrapping and then train your model. Okay, It's not uh, something that you can do while training your model and this is important because it adds uh, you know in real life it adds uh, some complexity in the whole uh, process at least if we're talking about models that are put uh, in uh, production uh, a third drawback is that since you know the the signal is the same uh, you create new samples that are not really that different from uh, from the original uh, time series, so you add some new information, but it's not that uh, different. Uh, an approach which is much easier to, to implement is, uh, you know, just uh, trying to add some noise to, to your data. Uh, for example, you can get a, a series like the, 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 the black ones you can see here, and then, uh, you know, just apply uh, a noise uh, on each observation. Here I just use a uniform um, uh, distribution between 0.9 and 1.1 uh, to, to, to uh, put some distortion uh, in the time series and you can uh, see that um, again you, you create some new series that look similar to, to the original one but they're not uh, identical. Okay, so you, you get more uh, information for your model. Uh, this technique is uh, very cheap computationally and uh, you can easily uh, implement it uh, online. Uh, the drawback is that still the new samples have very similar patterns with the existing series. Okay, so uh, again new uh, windows but there is are not uh, that different. Another technique we saw in the M5 uncertainty competition was, uh, you know, just um, getting your time series and uh, shifting uh, 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 randomly the series, uh, the, the level of, uh, of the series in order to create um, uh, new ones. Uh, this technique will probably work well for um, uh, regression trees where we typically do not scale our data. Uh, however, as you can understand, when you are working with neural networks where scaling will typically take place, this technique uh, is not applicable. In a similar fashion, one can try to uh, flip the time series, uh, either vertically or horizontally. Or, or horizontally. Uh, so these are just, you know, some uh, similar techniques to, to that where you just, you know, flip or uh, uh, shift your time series and uh, based on that you get 
some uh, uh, different bank series. Uh, another technique which is uh, uh, also easy to implement and it does uh, manage to provide different uh, time series for, for your model is uh, uh, a technique where you basically create some windows, some uh, input windows for your neural network and you just randomly select um, um, two or three or five or as many windows as you wish and you uh, combine those two windows in order to get a new one. Okay, so for example here I get randomly two um, uh, windows that are uh, originally available uh, in my data set and you can create a new one that is very different uh, from the other. Now, uh, a, 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 an important thing to, to, to notice here is that um, in order for your new series to be diverse, the number of samples being combined has to be relatively small because if you think about it, uh, when, uh, when the number of samples uh, combined gets very large, you basically end up creating something like uh, you know, how the average time series of your data set looks like. Okay, so uh, all the windows will look uh, similar. Okay, so you just have to keep the, 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 the number of windows being combined relatively uh, small. Some advantages here are that uh, this uh, approach is computationally cheap. You can uh, apply it uh, in an online fashion, okay, so while training your models, uh, you can get truly diverse um, um, uh, windows for your neural network. Um, the only problem is that the samples that you can, the new time series you can create are um, uh, limited based on the number of windows that you already have uh, available while starting the documentation. Finally, we have uh, another technique here. It's about, um, uh, you know, uh, interpolating, let's say, uh, the windows that are already available. <clears throat> here, in order to explain the, the idea is that, you know, you, you have a time series and you kind of zoom in a part of the time series, like you can see here, and then you can uh, add new data points between the, the original available ones. Okay, so this, um, what this uh, process um, uh, has uh, uh, as an advantage over other approaches is that, you know, uh, you can create uh, more uh, windows that basically focus on particular parts of the windows already available. Okay, so you, you can, uh, you know, out of a single window, create multiple new windows that each one will have very different characteristics depending on the area that uh, you focus, uh, you know, this, um, uh, this approach. Um, this is again computationally cheap at least uh, not as, as cheap as uh, the previous approaches, but it's still something you can uh, uh, do uh, automatically and uh, implement in an online fashion. Uh, the patterns will be diverse. The new patterns will be diverse and different from uh, the original ones. Um, the only drawback, I think, is that, uh, you know, the, the new samples are again limited uh, uh, on based on the um, windows that you already have available when uh, you try to implement this uh, this technique. Now, if you do not want to uh, augment your data based on the you know the windows that you have uh, available. Uh, you can also consider a technique like, uh, you know, a, a data generation uh, process. Um, here I present a very uh, uh, simple framework, yet uh, effective in doing so. We basically assume that 
each series can be decomposed in three parts, trend, seasonality, and randomness. And then you can, you know, just uh, uh, determine how much trend, how much seasonality, and how much randomness your series should have. And uh, based on these random numbers generated, you can, uh, you know, uh, create as many time series as you want, each having very different um, uh, characteristics. Okay, so this is uh, a, a process originally proposed by Fotos Petropoulos. Uh, and they have seen some uh, variations of uh, these techniques for um, from other researchers as well. Okay, so this is how the, the time series are generated. You basically assume a type of trend. Here I will I make a very simple uh, uh, assumption that the trend is linear. Of course, you can uh, have an exponential trend or, or a logarithmic trend or whatever you like. You also have uh, the seasonal part and then some noise. Okay, so this is what the new series generated will look like. Okay, so you can create as many new time series as you want. Uh, the drawbacks of this approach is that you cannot apply it, uh, you know, in an online fashion. You have to, to create this series before you start training your model and it's relatively computationally uh, expensive. Now to see how these uh, methods perform, I will uh, provide a toy example. Um, uh, a colleague of mine, Ar Artemios Semenoglu, uh, um, has uh, contributed uh, in, uh, in these experiments. Um, and uh, this application will mostly uh, show some uh, indicative results for the uh, yearly time series of the M4 uh, competition. Um, of course, some work must be made on uh, other types of data, but uh, I just uh, want to, to keep this uh, uh, quite simple for, for this presentation. I'm going to use um, a simple uh, multi-layer perceptron uh, to, to provide some, uh, some forecasts. The idea here is to, uh, you know, I want to show the potential of, uh, of the augmentation techniques and um, uh, at this stage, uh, not, you know, how uh, these augmentation techniques uh, may work with uh, other types of, of neural networks. Okay, so we have a, an input window of 18 observations and I'm going to forecast in the, the following six years. This is how the, the, the perceptron will, will look like. And this is how we train our, our model. We have, like I said, 18 uh, uh, inputs uh, and uh, six outputs. So for each series we create, uh, uh, we generate some input windows, some output windows, and we use that to, to train our models. Uh, in order also to see how the augmentation techniques work uh, in respect with uh, the size of the original data set. Uh, we will consider three different subsets, a small, a medium, and a large one. Okay, so um, uh, here, for example, you have very few time series and you will try to generate more to train your model, uh, while here you will already have a lot of series and you will just try to, to get more uh, out of your model by uh, uh, adding more series to, to the existing one. I'm going to measure the performance using the, the maze. And uh, I will also consider two uh, benchmarks for this. The uh, 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 perceptron that is trained using just the last window of its time series and uh, a neural network that is trained with all possible windows. Okay, so here, for example, you can see that uh, in the small data set, I have 134 series. If I use all possible windows, which is, let's say, the natural way to, to augment your data set to get the most out of the, the data you already have, you will have uh, 2.5 thousand uh, uh, input windows to train your model. For the augmentation techniques, I'm, I'm going to double that. Okay, so I'm going to 
create double the series of, of, of uh, uh, having, you know, using all possible windows. So here are the benchmark. Theta was the top performing statistical local model uh, in the M4 competition. So this is why I have it uh, listed here. Uh, these are the two MLPs and this is the performance for each of the um, five techniques, augmentation techniques I presented earlier. Now, what we can see here, first of all, is that when you start, you know, uh, and use a, a global model uh, using the last uh, windows, you can see that you get a, a good improvement over the, the local statistical model. OK, so this shows the, the potential of having a, a single global model over using um, a, a statistical model. And we can also see that when you increase and use all possible windows, you get a very um, a significant improvement over the, the previous model. OK, so uh, there's a, a nice drop here uh, in terms of performance. Now, uh, when you when you start augmenting your data, you can see that the improvements uh, basically depend on how large your initial data set was. For example, here you can see that since the, the data points were relatively small, when you increase your sample, you tend, you generally tend to get better results. Okay, for some techniques, the improvements may be small or maybe uh, slightly worse, but uh, in most of the cases you can see some uh, some improvements. Now these these improvements, as you can see, drop when you get to larger data set exactly because for these data sets you already have enough information to train that particular model. Now at this point I'm not sure you know if I had a, a deeper neural network if I would uh, you know if the results would be the same or for example if I would need uh, more data since the new model would have more parameters to train but the, the general idea is that, you know, for smaller data set, augmentation seems to be um, more uh, important. Uh, I, I will finish in um, uh, three minutes. I just want to, to, to say a few words about um, uh, another thing, another topic, which is uh, about um, Cross-validation, um, I, I basically feel uh, that uh, this kind of techniques should work, you know, horizontally uh, both your, your uh, modeling process because, for example, now we discussed about augmentation, how we can, you know, make sure that uh, which augmentation techniques work, works better on average or how exactly you should um, uh, set up this technique in order to work best, or if we go further, what kind of hyperparameters I should be using, how large the input window uh, should be used, uh, the, 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 the length of the window should be, uh, how an ensemble should work. Okay, these are just some of the questions we, we have to consider when we work with machine learning models in general. And in order to avoid overfitting and uh, make sure our, uh, you know, our validations and um, our decisions work also well for the post sample um, uh, of our time series, this is something uh, important. Now, originally, uh, in time series forecasting, we consider what we call the rolling origin evaluations. Basically, you you have a time series. We start we start with uh, you know having um, the first part of the time series. You forecast the following um, uh, observations. Then you reveal these observations. You forecast the next, and so on. Okay, this is the natural way to apply uh, an evaluation and uh, determine based on that, you know, which are the best, uh, the best setup for your model. The key issue here is that the areas for used are completely unrepresented in the uh, measurements of the performance. So you do not put particular weight on the last uh, observation, which should be more important. 
and, and also um, uh, uh, the early forts are also uh, fit on very limited training data. Okay, so these are some key problems here. Uh, so another solution would be to use what we call PERT k fold validation. It's basically uh, uh, similar to the k fold validation, okay, but the key point here is that you remove some observations from, you know, the, the boundaries of each fold in order to make sure that there is no leakage between uh, it's uh, the, the individual faults. Okay, so based on that, you can uh, basically, you know, use uh, even future observations uh, to train your model and still uh, have uh, a result that is uh, uh, representative um, of your model's performance. And even and if you want to to go further on that direction, you can also consider. Uh, what is called nested cross validation. You basically uh, have a, a validation within uh, your validation. Okay, so uh, instead of selecting based on what works well on the cross validation, you um, uh, uh, you know uh, include this in your modeling process. Sorry for that, Ivan. I think it, it took more like it took more than it should. So I will stop. Uh, and uh, let us have some discussion. Okay. Uh, thanks, Van Gilles. Uh, I've also asked Sven uh, Krone, uh, a lecturer uh, in our department and a good friend of ours, to provide some sort of discussion. So, Sven, over to you, and maybe you can have a, a chat together with Van Gilles. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Vangelis, and thanks, Ivan. Um, obviously, I'm a big fan of, of this kind of research. I mean, uh, that I think that's clear. I, I think also think this is really interesting and important research um, because, um, as you know, the, the forecasting center works a lot with companies and we often encounter areas where data sets, where companies have few data, a few times use, few problems, few um, um, few products, if you want to, and uh, and it seems to me this idea that you have global a global forecasting approach and then artificially generating more data to train a global model um, uh, uh, is an interesting one. Although I, I note at the same time you're in, uh, involved in a lot of competitions, and there it seems data sets can only get bigger, not smaller. Right? It's more data. You know, it's like ten thousand times use, a hundred thousand times use. So the exact opposite of what you're proposing here. So it's a an interesting thing. Um, maybe a, a short note, though, that um, I think your smallest data set of 230 time series, uh, you know, all of them being at least 18 years long, it's yearly data with just trend. That's a very unusual data set, but I think we've seen something like that in pharmaceutical data, long range planning. So uh, certainly, certainly interesting there. I, I was wondering if you could maybe go back um, to your results just to explain these a bit more, because I think the, your contribution is is, of course, one of augmenting data. Uh, not the cross validation. That's interesting uh, topic in itself. But the, you know, and you, I think you have actually come up with one or two new ways to augment data, which um, didn't exist before. Bootstrapping, so disaggregation, bootstrapping for moving average patterns, as Bergmeier, Heidman, and so forth did, uh, is one thing. But the combination interpolation, I think these are, um, you know, these these are really new things, right? I think you, you maybe went over that a little bit. But are these yes, that? I think the, the most novelty one is the one about the interpolation. I'm not uh, familiar with uh, such an approach, or at least I haven't seen that uh, uh, anywhere. And uh, I find it interesting because, you know, uh, you can zoom in uh, the patterns of uh, the time series and get more out of the, the windows you, you already have uh, available. Um, I think that combination uh, is also a nice idea. It's just uh, like I discussed, quite tricky to 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 confirm. You know how how many uh, series you should be uh, combining, um, and this is uh, basically an idea I came up with uh, after working with a paper with Fotos Petropoulos about uh, you know having lots of uh, time series and trying to find similar ones to, to predict another one. OK, so uh, the, the key idea is since, you know, you can use something like a k-means to, to predict, why not create, you know, uh, combinations that may also be similar? Yeah, um, 
I also like this idea of interpolation, like zooming in and creating more, although I think that would be complicated if you had to replicate seasonality. But can you maybe just interpret this? I mean, um, so noise is something that's often used in neural network modeling, actually using cleaning noise that goes back to 1986, 1988 papers, really early stuff, uh, Zimmerman, Neun, IR, they built it into neural network training to create diversity. And then later on, bagging was created. But can you, do you have any, any insight why adding noise does not work as well as you know, creating completely new data samples? I think it's not uh, that much about the noise. It's about that, you know, uh, you you basically have the same signal where you just, you know, add the, uh, uh, you know, play with, uh, with the randomness around the signal. So you, in the bootstrap and the noise where you see that, you know, you, you do not get a lot of benefit. I think this is more because you know, the, the the signal of the new windows, it's pretty much the same as the original ones. While in the combination, you get truly new series and also in the interpolation, you get truly new, uh, you know, um, uh, windows to train your model with. So this is, I think, what makes these two uh, techniques different. So basically, because we're only looking at, we only have trend and randomness, right? So you're only, cre you're creating new trends that didn't exist before to learn from um, uh, in, and, and of yeah, course that would make sense because the large data set where you already have uh, 235,000 trend uh, you know observations you know probably adding more will not add more more mm -hmm. accuracy um, on top of that so it's certainly interesting I think uh, it's worthwhile to explore this if you have small data sets to do that and to create synthetic examples you know like my you know over over sampling unusual things are creating them um, mm -hmm. from my point of view it would be interesting to see how that cre co uh, how that relates to bagging for example which is like a, a gold standard in many applications uh, and maybe also to see how that works i mean these are all global models how this would actually do against a, a local neural network model but those are just small additions to to that and of course yeah. i know that um before Ivan mentions it, there, there are some people in the audience that are not the biggest fans of maze, but let's leave this aside, I think, or, um, you know, you can you can add the 16,000 other tables on other error measures afterwards. Um, I, I certainly think this is, um, uh, this is pretty nice. Just looking at this and the window size, I know that in the PLOS One paper that, that you wrote with, with, with uh, Spiros and, and uh, others, um, you definitely, you also mentioned, um, efficiency, right? Efficiency and, and runtime is an important thing. And I, it seems to me you're going from forecasting a few few time series here. Um, you, you're going to, you know, creating half a million uh, a, a time series in order to improve a, a small improvements in forecast accuracy. If you look at the small data set, can, can you have some insights into, um, you know, the, the runtime of these experiments and um, sure. what the trade-off is, how you see the trade-off? I mean, is it worth to run a supercomputer cluster for, for a week in order to improve from 3.1 to 3.03? Well, yeah, this is this is an excellent point. Um, I think that simplicity in some cases should be um, is more important than having a 1% improvement, at least in some applications. Um, in order to give some uh, indicative times here, uh, when you train the, uh, the the model that runs just on the last windows. Uh, the running time is something like two minutes. Uh, if you run the old windows, this is uh, around five to ten minutes. And if you double that, uh, you get to a quarter or something like that. Now, these, these times may sound uh, small. Uh, and also keep in mind that you have a single model to, to use, but what uh, is omitted here is that, uh, you know, typically you would have uh, an ensemble of several models uh, to, to, to make your final forecast more robust. So these times could be, you know, triple or uh, four times that. Uh, and also this is a simple uh, perceptron, right? If you, if you try to, to train um, a deeper neural networks with more hyperparameters, these times would be significantly larger. Okay, yeah. so for MBITS, uh, for example, if you try that uh, using just the, the M4 data, at least in my computer, it would take a few days to run. So this comes back to your to your comment, is it worth having, you know, such a, a long uh, training times to, to get the dropping of 2%, let's say. 
Yeah. But these are short training times. I mean, normally when you look at building a, a deep learning face recognition or, or speech recognition model, we're talking about um, you know millions of US dollars invested in runtime, like a model that you know we're, we're training a model for 500, 500,000 uh, US dollars or something, you know, just pure mm -hmm. runtime. Uh, one thing is the training time, then there's the execution time afterwards. Basically, you know, this is this is you know using up more compute power at the moment than than bitcoins are. So. Well, you know, wherever that discussion goes on on green AI, but um, that that's certainly short. As a neural network guy, maybe just allow me uh, just then the question: how, how did you come up? I mean, a, a twenty-seven layer, multi-layer perceptron. You know, that's pretty unusual without any convolutions, without any uh, um, long short-term recursion. So it's not a, it's a, it's an autoregressive. It's basically a, a pattern matching between eighteen historical lags and the next uh, six steps ahead, right? So it's more, These are, something like a, you know, you could probably model this as a Boltzmann machine or something else. But um, how sensitive are the findings to, to this network architecture? Does it only work with this or does it does it not matter whether you use 10 or 12 or 15 or 27? Okay, uh, first of all, just uh, because this is a uh, misunderstanding, I have 20, 27 uh, nodes with three layers. So the 27 okay. is basically because I have uh, 18 input nodes, you know, I just have something larger than that. Uh, now, in terms of uh, robustness, um, the you know, using larger, larger, uh, um, you know, deeper uh, neural networks didn't make any difference, just uh, increased slightly the, the training process. What I've seen that uh, uh, makes a lot of difference is, uh, you know, how uh, you change the size of the input window. Uh, this this can really make a difference. Here I have optimized based on some validations in order to, you know, get the result that I need 18 observations to forecast the following six. Uh, if you if you make the input window too small, the results will be significantly worse. If you uh, get it larger. The results won't be that different, but you will lose a lot of uh, input windows that you could have used to train your model. So these are basically based, you know, based on some um, uh, validations uh, we've done, and uh, they seem to be working uh, steadily. You know, even if you run this a lot of times, you will, you will get basically the same results. Okay, so sorry for the misunderstanding. Then. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm aware that we're we're probably out of time. So, Ivan, do you want if you want to take some additional questions, um, or I can I can I can ask more questions. Of course, yeah, cool. Um, I, I mean, this idea. I mean, now just maybe getting away from this research, which I think is interesting, and you probably can add a, a few more results to this to to make it even more compelling. Going to this question of global versus local. I mean. Up until recently, I mean, deep AR was is, is, is a global approach, you know, from Amazon, um, and, and particularly looks at new new products or so short time series. And you also have a problem of short time series here. Um, uh, but then you have you, you now you see on the M5 competition, you actually see global approaches using XG Boost and others to do extremely well on long time series as well, right? So what's what's going on here? What's your view on this? Now, having having experimented with this, um, are we seeing are we? You mentioned that you know global models X, they're now the go-to models. Um, is that what you what you're seeing from your competitions, or uh, are there horses for courses? So like, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I think that you know when when you have uh, uh, applications like uh, you know energy forecasting with uh, smart meters where you get uh, observations every one minute or every how, an hour or something like that, you can get some thousands of data points and uh, this should be more than enough to train a neural network okay so in these uh, cases a local model i would expect to be just fine uh, now the, the competitions we have conducted uh, especially in the m4 the m5 you know have the uh, included daily time series so if you could have used some local models quite effectively in the m4 the you know you, you deal with monthly data where you will have something like 10 years of data okay so we're talking about 100 uh, observations of more or less uh so if you if you uh you you have to to use i think uh, an, a, a shallow neural network in order to be able to, to train with 100 observations 
So this is why I suggest that, you know, global models is the way to go when you have series that are relatively short. In applications where you have lots of data, you should just, you know, uh, you should probably work well also with, um, with local models. Another thing that I find important with global models, and this goes back to your nice comment about computational speed, is that, for example, in the M4, where you have 100,000 time series, if you wanted to implement local models, you will have to, to, uh, to train 100,000 models, right? And this, uh, because I, I had a benchmark like that in the competition, it took ages to, to, to compute. Well, with global models, you can have a single, uh, you know, model it trains in about 10 minutes and you're good to go. Uh, so this is another advantage, okay? Of course, global models have the disadvantage that, you know, in order to perform well, you typically have, you know, to identify some similarities between the patterns, okay? Uh, but again, this hasn't been proven yet. Uh, for example, in the M4, we see global models working well, although there's a lot of diversity. So. Um, there are some mixed signals there. Yeah. Well, maybe just decomposition is working well, and then you train the global models on the remainder. That's that's a cheeky yeah. way of uh, saying that. But I'm a big fan of decomposition and the theta method as well. Anyway, Ivan, uh, thanks, yes. Evangelis. It's really interesting. Thank, Thank you both. Uh, thanks for the exciting discussion. We have a couple of questions from the audience. So the first question is from Leonidas. And he's asking, have you tried to add autocorrelation structure in the noise components in the time series generation? I think this comes to this uh, bootstrap and STL idea. So. Uh, no, no, to be honest, I haven't. Uh, I've experimented with uh, some other uh, frameworks, for example, one uh, proposed by Kang where you again generate a series based on your uh, on some time series, time series futures. But uh, no, I haven't, uh, you know, considered something like an ARIMA process to, to generate uh, data. That, that, that would be fun, yeah. Yeah, that could be a, a future research, let's say, because there's a lot of different options uh, how to proceed, I guess. Uh, Christian is asking, how does interpolation work out when dealing with resampling of different data set with different frequencies? So, any comment here? Uh, since this is work in progress, I, I have seen it working well with uh, the yearly and the quarterly uh, time series of uh, the M4. We are currently working with uh, my colleague uh, Artemios to make it also work with uh, uh, with uh, monthly time series, it's uh, definitely more tricky because you lose the, you know, the sense of the seasonality while you zoom in. I'm not sure if the answer would be to again go with uh, something like the composition uh, before you know applying that. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Uh, I have a more general question, which is inspired by the discussions that we had uh, in the series of webinars. We had uh, several presenters. Uh, the question about the relation between accuracy and the final decision. I think you even had a paper on that uh, from M5. So uh, it sort of aligns with what Sven asked about the computational time, but in terms of costs, do you have any idea how much costs can be saved when you increase the accuracy using these methods? That's, that's so very tricky. For the M5, uh, yeah, I had a paper where basically it was shown that, you know, if, if you just have a very simple method that's based on, uh, uh, you know, a theoretical distribution, you would get results that on average look less accurate but uh, in terms of cost, you would get similar, in some cases, better results. Okay, so uh, I, 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 I understand that this would um, depend on the exact, you know, cost and the setup of the company. I, I wasn't aware of the details to, uh, you know, uh, make this uh, work in, in much detail. However, because I'm really uh, interested in that topic, I uh, have a, a PhD a uh, student, uh, Vagev Steodoros, and, and um, we're currently working actually on a setup where you uh, try to estimate this benefit 
to Azure. So you have you basically have a model where you know you simulate uh, you know how the, the inventory would change by making different decisions and having different accuracy, and then you have a connection. Uh, so if when when this is done, uh, uh, yeah, I will have some uh, better answers. Okay, uh, but the cost is definitely computational cost is is definitely uh, an issue. We have another work in progress with uh, Photius Petropoulos where we you know try to see you know uh, how much. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, money you can save when working on cloud. When working, for example, with simple models over um, uh, machine learning ones, and the results are um, you know very very interesting because there's also the climate impact uh, apart from uh, from money. So yeah, this is this is definitely worth checking. Right. Thanks. Uh I understand that it's complicated. It's one complicated question. That's why I decided to ask it, you know, <laughs> to provoke additional discussion. But thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, thank you, Vangelis. Thank you, Sven, for the comments and discussion. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, we will go on a break now and we will see what happens next. So, see you all online. Bye bye. Bye.